Thank you so much. It's a, a, a real privilege to be here in Lisbon. It's my first time in Lisbon. And uh, uh, I'm uh, going to be speaking over the next uh, week uh, here in Lisbon, then in Valencia, and in Milan. So I prepared. Uh, uh, what was interesting to me is that all of the cities were very much interested in this same topic of the transversality that is the topic mm -hmm. of this uh, conference. The, uh, in Milan, uh, we are working with the Triennale, and the theme is design after design. Uh, so there's this uh, big sense that there is a big change, uh, that there is a need to uh, work together across disciplines, to solve very complex problems that our world is facing. And, um, and so I see that this is a, a growing theme. And it's something that our Institute Without Boundaries has been dealing with ever since it was founded over 14 years ago. So I think um, it's, uh, I, I'll ask you to uh, bear with me because uh, there's, uh, the slides have been arranged to talk to all three cities. And the stories are kind of uh, an amalgamation. I have to say, I've never talked to a room full of PhDs. So this is a first for me. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I don't have a PhD. Uh, I, um, uh, I studied uh, architecture. And uh, at that time, uh, there was no PhDs in architecture. There was only the masters. And, uh, and ironically, I think sometimes today, I think that uh, uh, the a master's from before was almost the equivalent of a PhD now, that things have really changed in education. Um, I am uh, with George Brown College, which is a, a school that is right in downtown Toronto. It's a polytechnic in Canada. And um, I have quite the privilege to live in Toronto. My family is of Italian background. Uh, they're from central Italy, from uh, near Rome but from the Adriatic side. Uh, but I was born in Toronto, and Toronto is a very, very unique city. Uh, it is um, a city uh, that has a global soul. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, if it's easy to understand for Europeans, because it's a city where there's 170 cultures uh, who are living side by side. And for us, certain things seem very, very normal to live in this way, but then when I come to Europe and I see Europe and Europe struggling to, uh, to understand itself, uh, to uh, accept changes that are happening, uh, for me sometimes it's very hard. I have to wear a different hat and start to think differently because in Toronto everything is so easy uh, for hundreds of cultures to live side by side. Once I had uh, the very famous designer uh, uh, Enzo Mari in Toronto, and uh, Enzo really was driving us crazy. He did not like Toronto. It was a, una Babilonia, was his words. Okay, non si sa di niente, which means that it tastes of nothing. Uh, and, uh, and so I was struggling to help Enzo uh, understand because I think in Europe uh, it's a place of strong cultures and everyone has a very strong culture uh, but in Canada uh, we have something uh, that's slightly different it's a place of weak culture and it's uh, always been a place of weak culture because it started with a, um, a, a compromise in its constitution which was a compromise by different countries that agreed to live together so there was a French part, an English part, and an uh, indigenous part. And right in the Constitution was written that, uh, that there would be communities of communities living together, which really at that time maybe was something very different. Uh, and now, I, um, uh, as we move into this very globalized world that we are living in, uh, we are all of a sudden finding ourselves living in communities of communities. And so it's, uh, uh, for, uh, for us, maybe it's something that we've had for a long time, but for other parts of the world, this experience of really almost being colonized uh, uh, for, for 
Canadians, uh, that mentality has always been there. So I want to share a, a little bit. The title of my talk is uh, Creating a Wisdom Economy Through Generative and Collaborative Design Practice. Um, I'll try to share with you some ideas about what I feel this wisdom economy is. Um, and it's I come really from the research uh, that we've been doing uh, in our institute and the research that I've been doing since graduating from architecture school in 1985. I was very, very impressed yesterday. We got to have presentations from all of the research institutes here at the ADE. And I uh, was, uh, I think, struck by uh, how people, the more I travel, the more I see people struggling with the same ideas and actually finding similar solutions and similar uh, knowledge. And so I think it's wonderful that you're having this kind of conference where you're bringing people together. Uh, because I think we're all struggling very much with the same issues. Um, and so, for me, it started almost immediately when I finished my architectural education and started to do my architectural practice. And one of the things I realized immediately that, uh, and it's a, a strange thing because I feel myself, I had to have lived a very unique life. And the reason is, uh, my uh, family in Italy was very much uh, uh, living in an agrarian world. Uh, my wife often says that she finally understood me when she understood the Middle Ages, because uh, <laughs> I, 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 I lived in a medieval world. Uh, and it was mu very much so because the families immigrated from Italy after the war because of the conditions. They, were economic refugees. Uh, the fields in Italy, especially in the part of Italy where we were, were filled with mines. And so even my father, as a uh, youth, playing in the fields, his hand was blown off because of the war, so they couldn't work the fields. So they had to leave. And so they left and they went to Toronto, but they went not alone. They went whole villages. And uh, they set up in Toronto uh, their own little village. So I grew up on a street with nine families from the same town, all related to each other. And, uh, and then every day I would go to school and I went to an industrial world. So uh, we lived, you know, uh, for me it's so interesting because everyone is trying to uh, do slow food and uh, live organically and live healthy. You know, we lived in the middle of Toronto, and we had farms all in our backyard. We uh, uh, practiced all sorts of agrarian practices that are now very trendy. We did that uh, as a matter of course. And then our families would go to work in manufacturing and in the industrial world, and I would go to school in the industrial world. And uh, you know, so I grew up in really like what was the paradigm of the North American industrial post-war uh, baby boom. And then by the time I was finished architecture school, we were already uh, in a post-industrial digital world. Uh, and I'm probably the last, the first class to graduate using computers, uh, and the last two have used uh, Android. So in, I feel like in one lifetime, I have gone through the arc from the agrarian to the industrial to the post-industrial world. And it's given me kind of an insight that I think is special because I understand those different societies and how they work together. But uh, this long story is really to say that immediately I started to understand that something was happening in design and something was changing dramatically in design. And I really believe we, uh, it's, it started to change uh, with uh, uh, digital tool set. And it's really, uh, the design is changing uh, to something that I call visualization, simulation, and interaction. And uh, rather than designing um, a defined design, we're in the process of using these new uh, uh, ways of working. Uh, you know, because if you if you think about it historically, we lived in a world of art, architecture, and craft. That changed itself into a world of science, technology, and design. 
and now I think we're shifting to a world of visualization, simulation, and interaction. And so I'm going to try to describe that world uh, through the experiments that I've been living and the experiences I've been having in my life. Um, over the last two years and into this year as well, we have been working in Milan. Uh, Milan is a city that has always had a fascination for me because when I was very young, I went to Italy, but I wasn't able to go to Milan. My sister and my mother went to Milan to visit my aunt, and they had pictures of the Duomo, and all my life, I never got to go see the Duomo uh, until later, and I would see these pictures, and it was the part of Italy that had been uh, kept from me. But when I finally got to see the Duomo, what struck me most importantly about the Duomo is uh, it is like, to me, it's like the internet. It's like this giant uh, construction that is continually happening, that is always uh, uh, under construction, and it's really a story of a communal, collective uh, consciousness that is expressed in the city through this physical thing, and that's why they call it un opera non finita. And what it really reminds me is that really our lives are collective projects. It's really our life is this whole project that we make, that we live through, but it's always about our relationships with others, who we meet, who we shared our lives with, uh, our hopes, our work, uh, the way we build, a place to live, how we work in community with each other. Really, uh, that is what our life is, and I think that's actually what makes academic life so special because it's so clear that you're in a collective project when you're in a, uh, a university or a college. And uh, a little bit like Young, I believe uh, that our uh, that that collective uh, life that we're living is really about uh, the growth of wisdom. And I I believe this fundamentally because my grandparents would sit and would tell me oral bits of wisdom, and they were captured in uh, Proverbs. And it was really all about the uh, transformation from generation to generation and the handing of wisdom from generation to generation. And I think that's what we're all after. We all want truth, knowledge, uh, acceptance, love, and, uh, you know, an amazing thing happened to me once is that as an adult, someone handed me a book of poems by Rumi because he thought I would be interested in the poems of this famous Turkish poet. And I opened the book of Rumi and I was reading it and I realized that all the stories that I was hearing from my grandparents were actually paraphrases of Rumi's poetry. Uh, the most famous one, which my parents always loved to tell me, which was the story of the fisherman who uh, went, oh, the philosopher who went out on a boat with the fisherman, and the philosopher would say, do you know Plato, do you know Aristotle, and the fisherman said, no, no, no. And, uh, and then at one point a storm came, and the fisherman turned to the philosopher and said, do you know how to swim? And the philosopher <laughs> said, no. And he said, well, it's too bad, because <laughs> we're now going to die, because you don't know how to swim. But uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this interesting thing, because uh, I later learned <coughs> through the internet that uh, our region was dominated for 700 years, this is central Italy, by Turkish influence. So really what my grandparents were telling me was Rumi's philosophy. Right? So uh, this also helped me understand because as I struggled all my life to try to describe design to people, you're trying to describe it to businessmen, you're trying to describe it to administrators in the university, you're trying to describe what is it. And uh, for me, the, uh, the best description of design is really uh, uh, deeply philosophical because I, I, I think design really is what helps us uh, have a shared reality. We're in this room. The fact that I look at this and I say that this is a chair and that you're looking at it and you're saying that it is a chair means that we have a shared reality where we believe this is a chair. So without design, 
I almost wonder if we could ever have any shared reality because everything around us is design and design is reinforcing those shared realities that uh, we have. And in fact, I think what is so special and important about design is that not only does it uh, really reinforce our reality and our common understandings, but it describes the possibilities uh, and what can become of ourselves uh, in those common realities. So in, in that sense, it takes our sentiments and it turns them into embodiments. And by them being embodied, it means that we can all share them as sentiments. So without them, I don't think we could have shared existence. And so to me, that's fundamentally how I understand design. And uh, a few years ago, I came across this book, which I bought in a, a, a used bookstore. Uh, Alice Bailey is a, when I researched her, she's that little bit of a crazy woman who founded the New Age movement. Uh, but this quote to me, I think is one of the most powerful quotes I've ever seen. Uh, and it's about what education is. Uh, and it's that education is a continuous process from birth to death, concerned not so much with the acquisition of knowledge as with the expansion of consciousness. Uh, knowledge is of itself a dead end unless it is brought into a functioning relationship with the environment, social responsibilities, historical trends, human and world conditions, and above all with the evolution of consciousness which brings the infinite vastness of an unknown universe within the range of the finite human mind. Beautiful quote from 1954, uh, describing really the global consciousness uh, that we are trying to arrive at and that we're working towards. Um, and more importantly, uh, uh, and we had this discussion with Americo yesterday, which is how important theoretical knowledge is, but how ultimately more valuable it is when you actually apply it and you turn it into a real thing that, uh, that everyone can share and experience. And so I am very much uh, obsessed with uh, the problem that we have in education now, which is to divide the applied from the theoretical, mm -hmm. when actually the beauty comes when they actually come together. Uh, and I, uh, I sense that part of the tradition here at Ayada has been to try to do that. And, uh, and so I would urge you to continue. Uh, about 14 years ago, we founded with Bruce Mao something that we call the Institute Without Boundaries, and we did a major project. The Institute is a unique educational program. It has about 10 to 12 students who are interdisciplinary every year working on a public project uh, uh, and trying to solve complex global problems using new techniques of design thinking and, and systems design. Uh, one of our first projects was Massive Change. Uh, which was a major exhibition that, uh, uh, again, it was all about the theory of what was happening in the world of design uh, and in the design of the world, and then trying to actually take it and make it into an exhibition so that we could share it with others. Uh, it was very successful. We, we launched it in Vancouver, and then it went to Chicago, Toronto, and, and then to Chicago. It was seen by many hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, but it also really established one of our key philosophies, which is uh, the idea of designing together, so that you don't design for people, but you design with people. And so this is one of the things that we've been practicing. The other thing that we've been practicing at the Institute is the idea of designing with time. And so uh, one of the things that I've learned, uh, we work with something we call the design levers, but uh, we were doing a project called the World House Project, where we were trying to understand the evolution of housing. And so we did 11,000 years. We broke housing down into systems, and we watched them change over time. And it was very interesting what we were able to find and learn. Like, uh, really, we, under, we were able to understand that the agricultural revolution was really our way of mastering terrain, uh, and that the industrial revolution was really our way of mastering climate. And the information revolution was really our way of mastering economy, and that we're coming upon a new kind of revolution, which is our way of mastering culture and uh, cultural difference. So the, uh, this idea of looking at time and watching design in time also led us to an approach to design where we design with time. 
because sometimes the most complex problems can only be solved by designing the time and the process of change. And so it, for, me, for us, this has become a big revelation and it's something that we use a lot in our work. The other thing that we've been very obsessed with is the ideas of designing systems of design. In other words, tools that we can use to do design, uh, to do them more co-creatively, to do them uh, for people who are remote from us, just looking at all different aspects of how you design and trying to develop tools that help you design. And then the other um, part of the work we do, this is a sustainable house that we developed that it, uh, erects in a day and then it moves. We moved it to 12 different Canadian cities to show how you could create sustainable housing that was mobile, rapidly erected, flexible, changeable. Um, uh, but part of what we do is we take our theories and we try to design them into reality through demonstrations and prototypes. And in fact, I think our complex problems that we have in the world, the only way we're going to solve them is by building these prototypes and, uh, and actually revising them and changing them and improving them continuously, the way that software is developed and improved continuously. This became very clear to me because I'm involved with climate change issues. And one of the problems has been of always remaining in the level of intention and setting uh, metrics or targets, but then, you know, five years later, no target is met. And it's because really there's, and this is fundamental, because you can have an intention, but unless it's embodied in a process and a, a, a argent, the intention doesn't become reality. And so the politicians are always confused why they're not solving the problems. Well, this is because they're not designing solutions. They're remaining in the level of intentionality. Um, and. The other thing that we've begun experimenting with, this was an exhibition we did on sustainable transportation in the region of Toronto. But what we did is we brought together tw 20 groups of uh, 15, 20 people. So 300 people designed solutions for uh, the problems of transportation. And we made this exhibition uh, called MOVE. But it really, it's, uh, we won't have new ways of living unless we imagine them and prototype them and make them. Uh, that's the only way that we're going to make change. And what part of the problem now is we, I think, are trapped in rhetorics of change without actually imagining new ways of living. And so we have a lot of technology, but technology is not what's critical. What's critical is the imagining a new way of life. Now, I have to say another problem that I'm finding, <coughs> and one that I want to share, is that uh, I think as a society, we're becoming very obsessed with risk and aversion of risk. And, uh, and it's a fundamental problem which comes when you're not after a wisdom economy. If you're just after economy, you're going to focus in on risk because you just want things that will work. Uh, but things that are already working means that you're not solving the problems that are coming. So very easy then to for them to lead to a cycle of, uh, of uh, uh, ill performance of the economy because you're actually not anticipating things that are different. To anticipate things that you're different, you have to really apply your knowledge and learning towards wisdom and, and it means that you have to be ready to fail. So I have to say that one of the things in my life is I've failed many times. Uh, I can remember my first job where I failed with politically understanding the situation and I lost my job at, at an architecture firm. And then uh, I <coughs> remember working for our association of architects and trying to introduce literacy to children for architecture and failing to understand the politics of the association and, and, uh, and, and failing. My own first architectural practice I launched during the height of a recession and, uh, and then when I had children, I, I could not maintain my architectural practice because of the insecurity for our family. So I had to shift into a job, right? Uh, and, uh, but if I had never done the architectural practice, I would know so much less than I knew. So, uh, and once uh, I opened a gallery called the Real Time Gallery, which failed spectacularly uh, as well. So, the, you know, in my life, uh, I've had, failures. Uh, 
I, often, I think, when people come to make presentations, they talk only of their successes. I've had many successes as well. I, I developed the first live work, work by law. It was adopted uh, by a city, and then almost every city in Canada adopted it. It changed zoning. It broke down the single-use zoning. It was very big revolution, and I was involved with that. I, I worked with Canada Centre for Design and Innovation, and I built it into something special. I worked with the IWB, making something special out of the IWB. One of my favorite things that I've ever done that's been successful was the work I did with Renova, which is a, a Portuguese company. And in Toronto, they wanted to launch into Canada. And so I did three artworks with them over three years. So you have failures and you have successes. But really, uh, failures can teach you very many things, just like your successes. And I think uh, as PhD students, you should also take this uh, into account that you need to go down with your research into areas where you're not sure it's going to be right, and it's okay. It's okay to have not found the answer, uh, and it's okay to then learn from that and go find another answer, right? So I just wanted to encourage that. One of the biggest projects I worked on that involved innovation was something called the DXNet. I was very obsessed at that time with making a design that was not sequentially specialized. So I thought the big problem with design had become the historic development of specialization. As an architect, you worked on a project, then you handed it to the engineer, then you handed it to the landscape architecture, and then to the interior designer, and then to the this. And everything was a set of sequences, and it was inefficient. You know, you'd send your drawing as an architect, then the engineer would send it back to you, he would totally change the column grid, it would go in all the spaces, he would say architects don't know anything, he would say engineer doesn't know anything, and it was just a disaster. So I was trying to imagine how could you build a collaborative software that would allow people to work as if they were holistically working together across space and distance, and I did it. I built it. It was uh, amazing. We had in 1998, 16 to 20 people able to see each other on a screen, able to draw on drawings together to do all of this stuff. Uh, but really, it was also um, a giant failure because the architects and the engineers didn't want to be working together. They actually had grown so used to working separately and apart that they actually, the idea that their knowledge had to confront each other together was a super problem. So a, uh, the software was working, but people were not really willing and ready to use it. So it really made me understand uh, some really fundamental uh, issues. Uh, and that things are not just technological, but that there are social, uh, that there are business issues around things too. Like uh, when I made the software, they were convinced, the investors, after 9-11, they thought we were going to rule the world because we were going to be able to, you know, people weren't going to have to travel and they were going to be, and the software was going to make millions of dollars. So the interesting thing of these changes and these, um, these moments, so DXNet was very successful, but then it also failed. And I, th I think what I learned from that is that also at moments when something ends, it's, some, it's not always the end. Sometimes it's the start of something new. For me, the end of the DXNet brought me to George Brown and actually allowed me to start the Institute Without Boundaries, which was really the same project that I was working with the DXNet, but focusing on how to make a generation of designers ready and willing to collaborate with each other. Um, and, you know, a, in your life, I think the, the other thing to remember, and this is again moving to the idea if you're after wisdom more than just knowledge, is that things that you are often seeing in it's the most negative moment, it's not. It's actually a moment of inflection and change and opportunity to go in a new direction. So, what I learned actually about the, D the DXNet and what actually was most important out of it uh, was uh, that, that in design we had to move beyond the paradigm of the designer. And what I started to realize is that everything that I was enjoying, that I was doing, 
I enjoyed because I had done it with others. So when I had been in groups and teams making things, that it was a tremendously satisfying to me. Um, the other thing that I had learned was that uh, when, I, when I was always trying to do my own designs, almost at the expense of the user, that really I wasn't uh, learning anything. I was like, uh, in a way, I was like masturbating. I was just repeating my own uh, <coughs> ideas and not learning. And actually, when my design was getting the best was when I was actually interacting in a very powerful way with the users and having them influence and being almost like a channel for the design. And uh, the other thing that I realized uh, in that process was that uh, really that many, many of the problems of design and the impasses that we are right now are because we are not using time as a way of resolving uh, design processes and problems. Uh, that we have to move from designing objects or environments or uh, communications to a process of designing unfolding of reality. <laughs> and that when you start to imagine the design being an unfolding of reality, that all of a sudden you can solve things that were never solvable. Uh, so I tried to summarize these insights in something that I call a temporal framework. And it's the way I start to think about design whenever I start designing. Um, and so I did this thing, which I call the real-time meditation. And uh, it's, it's not truth. It's just a framework of thinking. And I have a long side, uh, you know, the epic, then some topics like language, knowledge, symbols, society, culture, etc. And then I have the epic, which is the epic of representation, the epic of abstraction, and what I believe we're moving to, which is an epic of transformation. And then I try to look at things in the world and see, you know, if language was in an era of representation, it was probably pictographic. But then when we abstracted language into phonetics and vowels and alphabets, it became alphabetic. But then now we're taking the alphabet and turning it binaric. And so these are kind of thought exercises of temporal unfolding that I give myself. And it helps me think as I'm designing to try to uh, think of these things, not because it's right, but because it starts me thinking about time and what can unfold in time and what is changing and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so, you know, to me, one of the ways of thinking of the politic was, you know, to think of the aristocracy and the peasantry, uh, which I, you know, I experienced, my parents had experience of that direct in Italy, and then the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, uh, but, you know, what I now call the consulterate and the bureaucracy, right? Uh, so the kind of identifying what are the real classes that are operating at work. And then it led me to something that I call the real-time manifesto, which was really that, uh, you know, if design is about transforming materials into uh, processes and realities, what I felt was happening is that we were taking material, this is all back in the late 90s, we're taking material, we were turning it into e-material by digitizing it, and effect to dematerialize our world, but really the important thing of the dematerialization was that we were using it to rematerialize. And I think this is, uh, for me, the, is describing this economy of transfiguration that we are part of. And so, you know, every time, you know, something comes out, like we started it with graphics, and graphics, we have this process, now we're applying this process to physical things. Um, and we're going to apply it to time and to uh, more things. And it's really about uh, moving society from the idea of human scale to a new paradigm of scalability. You know, so if I was to take, you know, there's human scale, then in the industrial era it's about economies of scale, but in this new era it's really about the scalability of things and designing things that can be totally scaled. Okay. And I described that as, as, you know, if the old era was an economy of sovereignty and representation, 
during the industrial era, it became an economy of incorporation and abstraction, and that now it's really becoming an economy of quantification and transfiguration. So these are the underlying paradigms that are at work. And the thing that's interesting is that all over the world, they coexist. So like uh, these things are still coexisting in the world. There are places in the world that are still in the economy of incorporation and abstraction. There's places in the world that are still in the economy of sovereignty and representation. And there's places where economy of quantification and transfiguration is emerging. And so in, if I was to look at that, like in a traditional economy, wisdom would come from experience. Even the educational model was apprenticeship where, based on experience. And then in the industrialization model, you'd have wisdom from expertise. And, um, and that's really where the universities and the whole system of knowledge is located. And in the moving forward, that there's really uh, going to be wisdom from exploration. And the idea that everyone is really in, in a mode of exploration. And really, PhD students are kind of a model of that. Because what you're trying to do is open up a new territory of understanding and learning. But imagine if a whole society is doing that. I think that society work is what we're moving to. Uh, so since then, I've been working with others to try to define like what I call the wisdom economy because I, it's just an intuition I have that, that in the future it's going to be increasingly about wisdom. So I, so I thought, what should I do? I should work maybe with a bunch of students to see. So we held a workshop in um, Milan, myself and Virginia Tassinari, uh, on the wisdom economy, and we got students together, about 60 students, to try to imagine what it might be. And uh, it was very interesting. It was really, really interesting trying to, to just asking normal students to, to imagine what a wisdom economy would be like and what people would do in a wisdom economy. Uh, it's amazing what the insights that they gave us. But really, what they just started to describe was a world where people shared knowledge and stories instead of hoarding them. So it was all about everyone's capacity to keep sharing knowledge and stories. It was, uh, uh, they, they would describe people freely assembling so that you wouldn't work in an office, but people would freely assemble and uh, meet in parks. Uh, without borders or barriers and uh, in, a, uh, in an odd way share knowledge and, and practices with each other. And um, what was important about it, I think, was that uh, all sorts of wisdoms were critical. So people who were different weren't marginalized, but they were actually welcome and integrated and that actually you would learn. Uh, this surprised me too because we've done experiments at the Institute Without Boundaries uh, uh, I'll give you just one example. We were trying to design a social housing project for Costa Rica. And so we had 45 different teams of architects from around the world all working on the same social housing project. Then we decided to add a team of 10-year-old students from an elementary school. <laughs> so all the 45 teams, none of the architects at all thought of earthquakes. They all designed amazing housing, structural systems, aesthetics, social all this stuff, but the children went immediately to the encyclopedia and they found that there were volcanoes and earthquakes in Costa Rica and they're the only ones that address the issue that the housing would have to be, I said, uh, would have to bear through an earthquake. So it really underlined to me, like the problem of our knowledge is that we, we are working always, uh, as we specialize ourselves, we actually miss the most important things. And so it's super important to have this uh, diversity of knowledge. Um, and then it reinforced for me some another concept, which is, I think, one of the big strengths that we've had during the Industrial Revolution was our capacity to make distinctions and to turn things into either ors. But as we move forward and as we move to a new world, we have to actually stop imagining the either or uh, because it means that you have a winner and a loser. Uh, and we have to start imagining more solutions that are ab about the both end. And this was particularly underlined because my son kept telling me why I would call, he was very upset that I would call myself Italian-Canadian. And he would say, you have to be Canadian. And I would say, but no, I don't have to be Canadian. I can be Italian and Canadian. And uh, he, uh, it's the simplification of a child wanting 
everything to be uh, uh, simpler, and really things are not so simple. You can be many things, and you should be able to be many things. So as we've been working at the Institute, and we've worked all over the world, uh, this is a project we did in Chile after the earthquake, trying to help them reimagine the housing and trying to really reimagine their economy. Uh, what we learned is that when we design with people rather than for them, uh, we can create a, a reality that we all live into together. So that's a very different way of thinking. I'll never forget Enzo Matic said to me, and, and in the most well-meaning way, that the role of the industrial designer was to think on behalf of people. And it's true. If you're working on a model where everything is going to be mechanically reproduced, the role of the designer is to think on behalf of people to be their guardian and to give them the best, right? But if you're in another model, which is not industrialized and not mechanically reproduced, where uh, uh, production is going to be ser uh, serial or it's going to be digital or it's going to be transformable and changeable by digital embodiments, then you're not designing on behalf of people. You're creating system that they can interact with to choose things for themselves. And that, what was so powerful about that is that when you open this up, you return, you address the problem that William Morris identified in the 19th century, uh, which is you return creativity back to people. And it's a terrible thing that happened during the industrial period, where creativity was limited to few people, uh, and this is an opportunity to return creativity back to many, many people, and it enriches their lives, because if you think about it, a life without being creative yourself, it's a very diminished life. And so if everyone is part of creation, they feel the benefits. And, and then their creativity comes to bear. And I think that's what I'm trying to uh, uh, underline as essential towards this wisdom economy that we're trying to work to. And it's an economy where everyone is able to be creative and to contribute, uh, as opposed to being a means of production. And so, you know, economy is just customs of the house, our behaviors, our interaction. Creativity is generating in the new and the valuable. Wisdom's quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. And education is the process of facilitation of learning. Now, the wisdom economy then would use designing time-based transformation. So you're, you're not designing a finished project. You're designing the process of change in time. Your, your, your storytelling and your sharing, your prototyping possibilities so that the prototypes can learn and evolve. So you're not designing a final solution, you're designing a solution that itself starts to learn from the use of others and then can change and can evolve continuously. And that you make that process of that design open and transparent so that other people can adopt it and spread and so that it can be used by as many people as possible instead of by few people. And uh, you're doing that so you're creating an inclusive world which includes everyone and everyone gets the benefits. So what does this wisdom economy require of us? It requires us to understand the flows of systems and the interactions within them. And it requires us to have a continuous learning about that so that we can generate new and valuable things to intervene and keep changing the flows of the systems. And this is a, a different way of thinking. It's a, a way of thinking that's very hard at first because it, it's, it's uh, repetitive and transformational and sometimes it's boring. Uh, and so like, if anyone has ever worked on a project to achieve sustainability, you know that sustainability is momentary and then you'll have to keep redoing and redoing it. And so that continuity of it is actually very frustrating for people. But, as our complexity is increasing, actually we need to have more interventions uh, and transformations, because otherwise the system is going to collapse, right? So in a way, uh, if you read Théâtre de Chardin, the, the famous French priest and philosopher, you, you understand that systems get more complex so that they can remain more simple. And so we have to really complexify to simplify. And 
to me, it's in this, right? Like, you, you are learning to acquire wisdom so that you can create something, so that you can generate something for your life, and then, but you do that so that you can then in turn educate a new generation and create wisdom and thing. And so there really is no finality to this, and it's an interactive process that we're all involved in. And so I, for me, when I, I, I took stock at one point to try to understand, you know, why innovation is so critical, um, to me, this is my insight into innovation. I've been involved in at least three innovations that were successful, many innovations that weren't. The ones that were successful, to me, they had always all of this happening. So innovation is always an ecology. So it usually starts with some kind of social <coughs> innovation, which is really about how do we want to live. Then it moves and it becomes a design innovation. How do we make possible how we want to live? Then it becomes a technical innovation, which is really about making, making that flexible, uh, repeat, repetitive, feasible and repetitive and re replicable. And then it moves into a business innovation, which is really how do you make people want it? How do you propagate it? How do you spread it? And ultimately becomes a political innovation because how do you institutionalize it? If you don't have all of this working, the likelihood is that the innovation is stalled or it doesn't work doesn't mean that the innovation is wrong, it just means that you don't have your ecology of innovation working as a, a complete uh, ecology. And so, over the years I've always tried to work this. So you can't create uh, uh, automated cars without addressing the political innovation that's going to be involved. Uh, I, the reason I, I learned these things because we worked on the idea of a social innovation of live work with IBM early on, and there were, all of these aspects were needed. People wanted to, especially women at that time, wanted to be able to stay at home with their children but not have to lose their job. And they didn't want to have to be forced to make that choice. But then we needed a design innovation, an interface that would allow them to, and we needed the technological backbone uh, to make that work. We needed the company to accept it. We needed a municipality to permit it legally. And only when we had all of those things, then did it spread. Okay. So we started in 2014 with the Wisdom Economy Workshop. Last year, during the Expo, we brought uh, 80 people together from around the world, and we reimagined our social systems. We redesigned healthcare, um, education, uh, transportation, etc., with a 10-year horizon. And it was this collaborative effort. From that, we did a book and a movie, and then uh, then the Triennale invited us back, and actually this Saturday, another 80 people are showing up to take the expo site, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be redesigning the expo site based on the ideas that we developed last year and trying to bring them into a reality of what it would look like to implement them on the expo site. Uh, so it's a, really, it was a global encounter to redesign social systems. So interesting to reimagine a social system with people from China and people from uh, South America and people from Middle East. It was very, very interesting. Uh, so much uh, learning. And we used a risk methodology, which I, I really love, which is rapid integration of skills and knowledge. Uh, and, uh, and we did a whole systems rethink. 60 people, 20 countries. What was special is we had 18 gurus from around the world talk about how the next 10 years were changing. So we listened to them, and then we designed after. And this is what we came up with. These were the ideas. Um, so in food, the, the idea was uh, kind of responsible food. Uh, and with health, there was holistic health. Uh, both uh, intervention and, and preventative health. In learning, was move, moving education from being limited to being lifelong and restructuring education so that it was without barriers. Um, with work, the idea was to actually recombine teams globally. And with uh, culture and communication, uh, with transportation, it was to tag and make transportation seamless by information technology systems. And then on the 
culture, the idea was uh, to have people collaborating on cultural projects across the planet. Um, so this is the kind of information. It was so interesting because you know, it was, in a way, utopistic, but in a way, there was all these problems that came out of it. What, when we analyzed what we had come up with, we, we, we realized was that uh, McLuhan's Global Village was in the process in the next 10 years of becoming a reality. In the next 10 years, we are going to have global systems of service, just like Uber created you know, global uh, <coughs> transportation system. This is going to happen more and more. But then there was all these issues that came up, like uh, you know, how much privacy can we live without? So the healthcare system we designed meant that you were tracking everyone's health. But then you had to give up your privacy to be tracked to get the be benefit of the knowledge of tracking everyone's health, right? How much transparency without feeling our identity and our pers or that we were at risk of our identity? Also, how do you, like, you know, for the healthcare system, for instance, if you're living badly, people will know. So do you want to be accountable for living badly, right? It was just all of these, you know, we were imagining these things, but then what was coming out was all of these problems. And what was so interesting is, is that actually you need to resolve these problems or the, what seems like a utopistic thing becomes actually a nightmare, right? Um, the other things that we're starting to understand is the impact of artificial intelligence. And in the next 10 years, it's going to have a terrible, terrible impact in terms of uh, job loss and job redefinition, right? Uh, and also, once you've got global standards, for instance, in the education, we wanted total um, uh, interoperability that, you know, you studied at Yade and then you could go to Toronto and, and continue your study. But you know, what does that mean in terms of then preserving differences and identity and different practices if everything is being standardized and harmonized globally, right? So, uh, and then, you know, how do you make cohesion also with this explosion of diversity? So all sorts of interesting uh, problems were coming out of the thing. And then, really, a lot of imperatives of how we would have to change were coming out of that, too. So what would we have to change in the way we are as people to actually live in this new global village? So now we're going back, and we're taking the expo site. And we're going to try to imagine like creating that global village in Milan and using that expo site as a site of how you would make uh, a global village. <coughs> I think I've talked a little bit about this, about you know design having uh, become empirical during the industrial age, and how it will be in the future, which is, I think, generative, collaborative, evolving and proposing systems and processes and effects that enable us to learn uh, through evolutionary intelligence. So if the designer on the, 21st, on the 20th century designed on behalf of people, and he worked for an entrepreneur, an industrialist, and he developed designs that could be multiplied by machines, the designer of this century will be a person who designs with the community that they are working for. They'll be a designpreneur. They will actually have to start their own company. This is a big revolution in design education because you have to teach people how to make companies. They'll identify opportunities through visualization. <coughs> they'll prototype them with simulation. And they'll build an evolutionary system where they interact with their users to keep the product changing and evolving over time. And they'll do that to really confront the massive change that is going to continue to happen in the next 20 to 50 years. <coughs> and in the century, the one thing for sure, especially with digital technology, is design is global, it's interdisciplinary, it's systematic, and it's entrepreneurial. Because the global economy is a digital economy. That's what's made a global economy. And it, it renders design a collaborative digital practice by necessity. Uh, my chair of design is doing her PhD on that very topic. She's analyzing three different products and how they're globally delivered. I, 2001, I became exit president, and we founded something called the International Design Alliance. It was so that all the design associations would work together. After 10 years, it failed. They didn't want to work together still. The graphic designers wanted to stay graphic designers. The industrial designers thought they were better. The interior designers, I don't know what they thought, but no one wanted to work together. 
So then after 10 years, what they did is they each founded their own association and called it the International Association. <laughs> so the graphic designers now have ECOD, International Council of Design, and ICSID has become the World Design Organization. So, so this shows you, I think, a little bit the situation. Everyone knows, everyone knows that a global economy requires interdisciplinary global organizations. But they're only willing to be their own interdisciplinary global organization on their own. Um, and so ICSID has become the World Design Organization. And it's heralding the need for a solutions economy because really the world is more and more desperate in need of propositions and solutions. So these, so I revised the goals that I had uh, 10 years ago, and these are the ones that I think are relevant now. An economic, we need to design an economic system that distributes wealth to more people more equitably in a sustainable way. And this is going to be increasingly important because of AI. Wealth and equity is going to only be exacerbated so actually we need to design the distribution system of money. And that is not an easy thing for people who've been designing chairs and who've been designing uh, interiors or streets, you know. We need to make a transportation system that is automated and moves people efficiently and effectively without impact on people's health and the environment. We need an education system that increases wisdom and has to be a continuous education system because you'll never stop learning and it needs to balance working, learning, and playing. We need a healthcare system that provides both physical and mental well-being and is both restoring people's health when they're ill but also preventing them from getting illness. Um, and we need an employment system that brings opportunity to everybody uh, and uh, makes it uh, makes all jobs dignified, you know, because uh, in the future there's going to be increasingly uh, different types of jobs, many, many service jobs, and uh, there's not a sense of dignity in those jobs. And then we need a cultural system that fosters diverse expression uh, and yet maintains social cohesion. So, so how, and this is going to be really difficult, because how do you give people absolute diverse expression without them eroding the social cohesion? This is going to be a, a very big challenge, and we need to think through these things. And then we need uh, really uh, a building systems that's sustainable and uh, that helps regenerate the planet rather than uh, reducing the, the uh, quality of life on the planet. Uh, so one of the things that we've started doing, and I'm going to ask doing, ask people to do, is, is to really try to rethink your profession. Right now, we spend a lot of our time working for others, uh, but we don't do research and we don't do public service. So this is just a proposal that we take 10% of our time to work with each other instead of alone, uh, and to take our best resource, which is our ideas as designers, and to freely give them to an important public project or to transformative research and uh, to raise money for these transformative projects and to work with citizens to improve the public realm. Why do I believe this is so critical? Because uh, I, I know that we all have to work for somebody, and we all do. But right now, more than ever, we have to work for everybody. So we have to take a piece of our time and dedicate it to research and to public service to solve the problems that everyone is having. <laughs> Um, and so if you take 90% of your time to earn your living, and you take 5% of your time to innovate through collaborative research, and you take 5% of your time to work with projects with others, this means maybe an evening a week, a week twice a year, or a summer every two years. But I'm sure that that's 10% that we would take will transform all of the 90% of our work that's remaining. I really believe that. So what we've done at our school is we have our Institute Without Boundaries and we realized we need it to be out in the world, so we created something we call Civis. And it's an office. We set it up just outside the school in a separate place. We all share. We share the, the location. We share the overhead. We share the creation. And uh, we work with the citizens. And, uh, and so we're trying this out. 
we just opened a year and we're trying to think and see can we make something like this work? Can we do it? I believe that if we set these up in cities around the world and they're all interconnected with each other, we can actually make a meaningful difference uh, on projects and collaborate around the world with each other. Um, my own personal story is a, a, a life spent working on the both end. As I mentioned to you, you know, I, 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 you know, I am Italian, but I was born in Canada, and I'm Canadian. I'm trying to resolve like how you are all these different things. I've been an architect, but I've done industrial design and graphic design. I write poetry. I, I am like a complex person. And one of the things I've always hated was that you had to be one thing. And I actually think it's a big mistake that we're always trying to make people be one thing. And, uh, and, and actually, we're always many, many things. And uh, it, it, to me, it's the only insight, I think, that we have in Canada to give to the world. Is, uh, it's, it's the one rare thing that we have, is that we are all, there's no Canadian that is one thing. You know, they, they, they are all, we are a country of indigenous, of immigrants, of refugees, and uh, we, we all are complex and different, and it's our complexity and difference that keeps educating us. And to me, it was underlined for me, at one point, I actually had to go to a support group for help, uh, because, you know, I had gone to my school, and the, there were many problems at the school, and lots of fights between the academics, and it was not an easy situation, and I was used to always winning people over, I'm a happy guy, I could make everyone happy, and I could not make these 50 people happy in the School of Design at the school. They were only wanted to be unhappy. So I went to, to get help, right? And uh, in that room, there was a person who was uh, with cystic uh, fibrosis and his life. And uh, I said, I don't know, I don't know what to do, etc. And he, only way he could talk was actually by pointing at letters, because he couldn't speak because of the cystic uh, uh, fibrosis. Uh, so he pointed and said, <laughs> It's do, don't worry, you have the gift of change. And uh, to me, it, 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 it uh, really underlines something that you, you can learn. You know, I, here was someone who could not speak, but he could teach me something that I should have known always. And, and uh, it's something also that people always try to tell you, like things will never change. I think the big message right now is in media and everything, is that things don't change. No matter what you do, it's gonna always be the same. But it's not true. Things change. Things change a lot. And in our life, we change a lot. And so, uh, to me, it made me realize that this thing of change is a tremendous gift, because no matter how bad it can be, you can change it. You just have to move in time to make the changes that you need to make. And I was actually able to I actually thought I would have to fire everyone in the school and start a new school, and it wasn't the case. I actually worked with people, and slowly, slowly, things changed. They changed. They became happy. They became happy. I couldn't believe it. Like, if you would ask me, that person could never be happy, right? But then they were able to be happy, but I had to, I had to do something very, very difficult. I had to listen to them, right? And I had not wanted to listen to them. I had wanted to just... So now I'm just going to share with you um, the discipline that I've been using to evolve this collaborative and evolutionary design. I call it systematics. To me, the future of design, and now I, I have to, like I'm very busy running the school, so I can only do small design projects, and these are small design projects that I do to test my theories. So the, um, it, the theory is that the future of design lies in creating systems that allow people to personalize and co-create designs for themselves. And so the methodology, I call it SIMS, Scalable, Interactive, Modulable Simulations. And SIMS is a process for generating design. It uses holonic recombinant elements. It's guided by variable dimensional material and formal systems. So you can build it out of anything, to any size. You create evolutionary products and environments and communications and services and you allow for collaborative creation, <laughs> production, and consumption. 
so why it's so powerful to me, it, it allows for the dream that everything can be more than one thing. And by its transfiguration of its context, it can truly live forever. And to me, this was a way of trying to solve some of the problems in sustainability. So this is just my, my work to try to do that. So the, the, uh, the secrets are that it's generative, that it generates complex objects, environments, and it digitally captures sentiments that can be transfigured. It consists of a process of developing these archetypal elements uh, that have an originating concept and that can be materialized in the physical world. The elements are able to transform by size, by material, and they can be manipulated by the end user. And the elements can be made of multiple materials or in combination with the material governing the scale of the element. And that they can be stretched dimensionally and altered so that they can reflect the personal preference of the co-creator. And the combination of base elements gen generates multiple forms. So it started with a sketch that I did about 15 years ago to create like a piece of furniture that I could put into this real-time gallery, which is one of my spectacular failures. I lost $50,000 on it, but it gave me this. And so this is like a sketch, which I'll try to show you how I was thinking. I was thinking of a dot becoming a line, becoming a plane, then turning into an element, and that I, by conjoining it, I could repeat it. And then all of a sudden, I had created this form, which was an archetypal form. That archetypal form, I could stop, I could interpret it, I could rotate it, and I could offset it, and I could arrange it, and I could reset it, and I could reflect it, and I could agitate it, and I could order it, all the same elements becoming different things. And then I could make it from anything, and it could be different sizes, because it was made from different things. And really, I could make a whole world out of this one thing. And, uh, you know, I bench world. And so, and then I could actually make a software program that allows other people to interact with it and to change and, uh, and evolve it. And so I said, let's try it. And so I made the furniture of our school using it. And, uh, then I made artworks that were like, it starts in a way, but then people can change it and play, and it always is beautiful. And then when the art was over, everyone stole them <laughs> because they wanted to use them because they were so interpretable. And so the artwork exists now on everyone's desk, right? And that's when I realized that this was right because no one would ever throw them away. We had bought IKEA furniture supposedly sustainable, but after a year we had to throw everything away and rebuy it, right? And then this, you made them, and they never went away. People just kept reusing them and interpreting them in different ways in their life. And then they're interpreted again to make the store by the students. And there you see them making the canoe home. And then you see them growing in scale to become a pavilion for a project I did with Renova. And then you see the same elements changing so that we could keep changing the exhibition every time the location changed. And then you can see them making a, a city. And so I, I thought, let me do another experiment. Let's see if we can do this again, not just the benches. So I came up with the, this thing, open lattice. The open lattice is really, <coughs> it, it's the, the idea of, I think, the weak culture that is Canada where you have this lattice and that all things can come into it and bleed through it and take part in it. And it's a cross and a frame, so I used it to build exhibition system. And it's just very simple, these frames and these crosses. And there it is, an exhibition for Noel, because we had an exhibition for Noel. But then my students take it every year and they turn it into an exhibition uh, for their projects. And you can see the open lattice at work. And all the time it's changing. And we've never had to throw it away. 
and every other exhibit system we have, we throw it out after the, the first year, right? After a year or two. And you can see it being made of different materials. And you can see it making a garden shed. And you can see it making another exhibition. And so it's never, ever lost. It just be, is continually reused and reutilized. That's the same system making totally different shapes. And then another project for Renova. And then furniture. And then artworks, all made with the same system of the open lattice. So this is my experiments. I I'm going to be continuing over the next years, trying to do fashion this way, <coughs> jewelry, trying to do all different sorts of projects using this kind of philosophy and seeing where we can go with it. Um, but one of the things that I learned at the experience at the college is how critical it is that all of us have this need to be eventualized and to be accepted. And all of us have this need to have our vision and dream in the world. And so, like for me, the goal for design now is to facilitate that. Is what can we do as designers? What can we do to actually uh, enhance that reality for people? So my, my, my favorite project that I've done, and it's the third project that I did with Renova, uh, it's called The Lovers of the River Almonda. It was done for Nuit Blanche in Toronto. Uh, and every year I have to make, for the past three years, uh, artworks from toilet paper not so easy. Um, this artwork was very special because what we did is we interviewed people who are in love and we asked them four questions. So really it was a research project. We asked them four questions, you know, when did you meet? Why did you fall in love? What would you feel if the lover was gone or died? And um, What made you stay with them? And so in one night, we had 200 couples come, <coughs> have them interview. We would photograph them in front of this backdrop, which is made of 3,000 nails with toilet paper uh, strewn between it. They would be photographed by my team. Then uh, myself and my wife and my two children based on a system of poems, we would write the poem while they were being photographed. And by the end of the photograph, they would come back and receive the poem, and then it would be posted, and then it would be shared on the net around the world. And why am I saying this? Because why is this my favorite work? It's my favorite work because it is uh, what I call deep interactivity with you know, as an artist, you can make something and they watch, and right? someone sees it. But this was different. I had to deeply interact, understand who they were, and actually make a work of art just for them. But it was so tremendously satisfying. So this is a couple, uh, a Iranian couple. He's an engineer, and she is an industrial designer. And this is the poem. I interviewed him and her, and then I made the poem that he would write to her. So I read it back to him, you know, and I said, his, her, she is Bahar and he's Hamayum. And the poem is, how is it your smile blinded me, your eyes deafened me, I lost all sense of time, boredom vanished, life a journey, the heights of the Alborz down to the great inland sea where my quiet was filled by your music, your noise, your excitement at living. I read it back to him and then all of a sudden he started to well up, he started to cry. And he said to me, it's 30 years that I need to say I love you to my wife and I can't say it. I have no words, no skills to say it. Thank you for letting me say how much I love my wife. So to me, this is the, uh, uh, you know, to me this was my closest that I ever felt in my life that I was trying that I was creating a wisdom economy by creating an experience, a design that I could share uh, and 
help people share with each other. The, um, the beauty of it, too, was that I learned for myself, from when you interview 200 people and you ask them the same question, you know what it is as a PhD researcher, what insight you got. I learned more in that one night about why people love each other than I had learned in, in my whole life. And so uh, it was beautiful for them and for me. And so uh, a true bow band. So I leave you with just these thoughts. Join one of our projects. Start mm -hmm. your own here. You already have, I think. Uh, work with us to build a global village here in Lisbon. Sorry for the spelling. Uh, <laughs> at, at Valencia or Milan, I didn't get a chance to review. The, my graphic designer is not so good at spelling. And uh, that will be a beacon for the world. Thank you for listening.